five years in not-for-profits, most of that time with Greenleaf Family Center in Akron, uh, where I was the executive for many years. Um, we provided, uh, we were a private nonprofit, um, not part of the government or anything like that. Uh, we offered a whole variety of programs for families, ranging from personal and individual counseling um, to uh, services for teenagers. For about 23 years, we ran a program for pregnant teens that included education, social service, and health care. Um, we had programs for the deaf. We had programs for economic improvement. We had programs for uh, um, lots of good things like that uh, with a variety of, um, so I had a variety of experiences in fundraising of various kinds, um, foundations, government, so forth. Um, so that's my background. Bill? And I'm Bill Glazer, and I'm uh, retired over a decade ago as the president and general manager of PBS 45 and 49, the local public television stations. Uh, they're now known as Western Reserve Public uh, Media. Um, had a, over a 40-year career in broadcasting, most of it in public television, although I did work in both commercial radio and commercial television early in my career. But most of my time was spent in public television, which is nonprofit. And, besides general management experience, uh, pretty heavy duty experience in, in raising money, uh, especially uh, obtaining grants from the federal government. Uh, and we're gonna talk about how, as we go through the program today, of how you can raise money from various sources because you will find that will be your biggest challenge. Bob? Yeah, thanks Bill. Okay, before we get started in our program, which will be about three hours, um, We'll take a break halfway through. We encourage you to ask questions. This will work better if, uh, if we have a little bit of interchange uh, as we go. So I want to start by circulating the room and be brief with your comments if you would, but I'd li we'd like to know who you are, particularly in terms of what your interest in not-for-profits is what kind of things you're involved with or thinking of being involved with, if we could. Can we start here? Uh, my name's Eric, and I am basically here to figure out if I'm trying to, how I'm trying to structure a business with a partner. Um, we're not sure if we're gonna be not-for-profit or for-profit. We're trying to figure out what guidelines we fall between, so this is educational for me. <laughs> okay, well, that, I think you'll probably get an answer to that or at least some ways to decide that. Um, I'm Terrence, and um, I'm really just here for information to learn more about nonprofit, just completely unaware. Okay. And I should say, we don't know everything about not for profits. I want to clarify that. We know almost everything. Um, hi, my name is Linda Hale. I'm actually involved in sort of the community redevelopment entrepreneurship thing that's happening in Akron right now, and we get a lot of questions, so I'm just here. Hopefully, I can answer some of them. My name is Ray Gehani, and I'm interested in how nonprofits innovate. I'm Mike, and this is my daughter Keegan, and we're interested in, at the least, setting up a, a scholarship in my father's name, but what we'd really like to do is something more broad and do a foundation that does a lot of good works for kids. With regard to innovation, I'm not sure how much we'll get into that, but uh, we may touch on that a little bit. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Dan Dean. Um, I'm starting at my own nonprofit aimed at helping male cancer patients and survivors thrive after a diagnosis. Thanks, good morning. My name's Abby Greer. I'm the executive director of the Kent Community Time Bank and now the Crooked River Alliance of Time Bank. So, I'm running two boards and I'm a little overwhelmed and I was gonna say I'm a, I'm a patient of Bill's. <laughs> Maybe a client, but I like to call it a patient. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. Hello, my name is Mark. I spent about 35 years in industry and my part-time passion 
is service to others, and I'm interested in changing, jumping from industry to nonprofits, and I wanted to come here to find out how nonprofit companies work. I don't know that I would want to set one up. Hi, I'm Beth Lindenberger, and I'm an artist and educator, and I currently join the board of the Cuyahoga Valley Arts Center, which is kind of on the cusp of becoming more, uh, leaving its traditional ways of everything on paper, and um, establishing uh, a different kind of fundraising solution, and becoming more web-based. And so I would like to learn more about how nonprofits operate, and, and hopefully, assist some of the other people on the board to bring it up to current times. Hi, my name is Ashley. Uh, my friend and I just started a program at the Children's Hospital uh, photographing the NICU babies, and we are looking to uh, expand out and start on the fundraising end as well so we can do patient support. Hi, I'm Melody, and I have a marketing background. I've done quite a bit of volunteer work, and I'm interested in fundraising and grant writing. Hi, I'm Heidi Johnson, and I have worked at a number of nonprofits. Um, that's been what my career path has been. In addition, though, I teach at Kent State, and I, we have a minor in nonprofit management, so I teach those classes. Um, I am an alum of PBS 45 and 49. <laughs> and um, so I'm really, and I'm on boards. I'm on United Way's board in Portage County, and I'm just here to learn more about the startup side of nonprofits because I have a lot of working experience but not startup and that's part of what I'm teaching at Kent State. My name is Ellen and I'm here basically for education. Um, I was involved in the inner city in Detroit when we lived there and I'm getting more involved here in um, Akron and then looking to Cleveland and it's just more to understand the whole environment. Good morning, I'm Pam. Um, I'm from Worcester, Ohio. Uh, involved with a group of people who are um, going to start a Friends of a, par a City Park and we're going to be um, forming a, a not-for-profit corporation so that we can raise funds to support the park. Hello, my name is Leslie Stickers. Um, I'm based in Akron. I'm a recent graduate of the University of Akron um, and I'm looking to start um, a nonprofit. Good morning. My name is Walter Pechenuk, and uh, last year I got involved with the Northeast Ohio Association for Computing Machinery, and right now they have a robotics project which is uh, funded by the National Science Foundation, some other government agencies, and I think from what I've been told that it's supposed to run out by the end of the year, so I'd like to learn a little bit more about extending these grants. And I think we should also start looking at trying to raise funds from local industry, and I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, good morning, my name is Tom. I, uh, I'm assisting a group of people that are establishing a nonprofit uh, uh, working with uh, formerly homeless veterans. Uh, there's a, the VA in Wade Park has a domiciliary program. They help people, uh, uh, these, these men and women, uh, find them a place to live, but they often, there's no furnishings at all. Uh, so this group's gonna be collecting household goods, appliances, furniture, stuff like that, uh, to, and then you know, getting them to these people. Hi, my name's Kim, and I have a girlfriend who's interested in helping the vets with their service dogs and giving them baths and veterinarians. So I'm just here kind of learning. Good morning, my name's Kimberly. I work um, at BVU, the Center for Nonprofit Excellence, and I work with a lot of nonprofits um, to help them to see you know, what um, services that BVU offers. And um, we do a lot of consulting, but I've never started from the ground up. So uh, my husband and I um, may be looking to um, start a, a small nonprofit, um, so I'm looking for the, the startup side of it. Good morning. My name is Ram Vijay. I've just retired and I'm searching to assist some nonprofit foundations. 
Uh, good morning. I'm Karen, and um, I've worked in and out of uh, nonprofit for a number of years in the arts side, um, ballet companies, uh, various art shows type things. Um, I'm actually a few steps into my nonprofit already. I actually got my IRS letter a couple weeks ago. So <laughs> I'm on my way, but the, one of the things I'm working on is developing a consistent fundraising attitude, uh, trying to find a way to make sure I can keep things moving in the right direction, especially with the uh, changes that they've made in the IRS coding, so. Good. Boy, what a variety. <laughs> you can see the nonprofit world is, is big. Um, we will, uh, let me see where I am here. <clears throat> Okay, we, um, we have a program about three hours. Um, it's the nonprofit ba basics. <clears throat> and we'll be talking about, very briefly about SCORE. Uh, then we'll talk about what nonprofits are, how they're governed, how they're managed, a bit about financing. That's where we'll get into the foundation stuff. Uh, and and how you set one up um, once you have an understanding of of what nonprofits are, then we'll talk about how to do it. Okay. What is Score? Score is a is a nonprofit. Um, its mission is to foster vibrant small business communities through mentoring and education. And our vision is that every person has the support necessary to thrive as a small business. Nonprofits generally are small. There are aspects of them that are business and we'll be talking about that as we go. So it does fit with SCORE. SCORE is, um, is made up of volunteer counselors uh, so depending what your interest is, you might be a volunteer with SCORE. Uh, if you, especially if you have business experience, a variety of experiences. Um, we have served about 45,000 clients over the years. Um, SCORE is part of the Small Business Administration. Uh, not that they um, uh, run us or that they give us money or anything. I think it was a very tiny little bit of money. I think it pays for water. Um, but we are part of that, and uh, the counseling done by volunteer counselors is free and it's confidential. So um, what is shared about your business is shared within SCORE in order to help the counselors prepare to work with you, but uh, we're not going to be talking to the world about who's visiting with us and why. Okay, Bill, you want to start this off and... Talk about what nonprofits are. I should say restrooms, in order to use restrooms, feel free. You need to go into the library. Uh, the doors here are locked, so you need to go in the library. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Whoops, we turned it off. There we go. Okay, what is a nonprofit? Well, a nonprofit is an organization organized and funded to further or founded to further a cause. That's what a nonprofit is. Um, we can t we'll, we'll talk as we go through because there are some differences in nonprofit organizations and, and what they do, but that's what a nonprofit does versus a for profit who exists to make money for people. And we'll, we'll talk about some of these differences too as we go along. Now there are any number of nonprofit organizations and some of them include things like service organizations, Kiwanis, Rotary, the Elks, but they also in, can include educational organizations, uh, various schools, um, scientific organizations, business leagues, chamber of commerces, social clubs, labor organizations. These are all various types of nonprofit organizations. But what we're talking about here with you this morning is this one, charitable organizations. 
the, uh, these others are nonprofits, all right, but they are not charities. And, that, and there's a big difference there between how, say, a chamber of commerce or a labor organization works and how a, a nonprofit charity works. And we'll, again, we'll, as we go through, some of these things will uh, become uh, evident. Nonprofit charities are designated by the Internal Revenue Service as 501c3 organizations. And there are two types of 501c3s. And some of you, when we did the introductions, talked about wanting to set up foundations to raise money for, for projects. And we're going to talk about the, the difference between those kind of charities and what are called public charities. Public charities, these are organizations that exist to provide services. So that would be things like the Akron Canton Regional Food Bank or Goodwill Industries or the Summit County Historical Society. Those are, are they provide services to um, the greater community. Public foundations, on the other hand, raise money. There are things like, and then they, and they make grants to programs. Those examples might include the Akron Community Foundation and the GAR Foundation. Now, when you're organizing yourself and you're filling out the application for tax exempt status with the Internal Revenue Service, that's one of the questions you're going to be asked. And, it, and you need to be very clear about that, um, whether you're going to be a charity or a foundation. Be and one of the big differences is foundations have to give away a certain percentage of their money every year. So you don't want to organize yourself uh, as a public charity, but then check, check the box as a public foundation because you're going to end up having to give some of your money away every year in order to be compliant with the IRS regulations. The charity doesn't have to give any money? No. If it, a public charity provides services. So example, the food bank collects food and they give the food away, but they don't give money away necessarily. But if you're a foundation, the Akron Community Foundation has to give away part of its endowment every single year. And that's a requirement. Now, there, again, the diff there are differences between how for-profits operate and non-profits operate. For-profits produce, market, and sell products or services to make money for their owners and investors. That's the only reason they exist. Acme sells groceries, and you say, great, they, they do a great job. Well, they do, but they do it only because they make money for their owners or their investors. If they weren't making money, the people behind Acme would get out of the grocery business and do something else. I mean, trust me, they would. That's, that's how private enterprise for-profit organizations work. There's nothing wrong with that. That's how they, they operate. Nonprofits, on the other hand, produce, market, and sell products or services to improve the community. So again, think of how the food bank operates or um, uh, Goodwill or any of the nonprofit organizations. Uh, they exist to improve the community. They have a product, all right, but, but they, don't, they don't profit from that product the same way as a for-profit organization does. I have a question. Yes. I would need to know a little bit more about what your business is actually going to do to be able to really answer that more thoroughly. But you can certainly, as a nonprofit, you can certainly charge for your services. Uh, but you have to be a nonprofit. You have to be organized as a nonprofit in order for donors to be able to make donations to you and be able to deduct those donations from their income tax. We're going to talk about that in great detail later on this morning as we go through the presentation. Okay. 
Okay, characteristics of a for-profit business. These are publicly or privately uh, stock owned. In other words, it could be an individual, it could be uh, a company that's like Goodyear that's listed on the stock exchange. Um, the income and the profit benefits the owners. A for-profit is governed by the owners, either again by an individual or a partnership or a board of directors, if it's again, if it's a larger corporation. A for-profit business may be bought or sold with the profits of the sales going back to the owners. Um, the owners own it, they control it, um, it's theirs. And as long as it's legal, um, it can work. But the characteristics of a nonprofit business are very different. There's community ownership as a, as a beginning point. There is no private interest, there's no stock. The, the community owns the nonprofit. No one can personally benefit from the earnings of the nonprofit. That's the board members, the employees, the volunteers. Now you can certainly pay your staff, but you don't pay your board members. Uh, if there's money left over at the end of the year, the money goes back to the non back into the nonprofit. It's not distributed as uh, bonuses or as uh, stock uh, uh, payouts. So income that's greater than expenses must go back to the business. It's a nonprofit is governed by a board of trustees or a board of directors. Those are interchangeable terms. These individuals represent the community. Um, and a nonprofit can never be sold for a profit. If the organization is going to go out of business, the assets have to go to another nonprofit. So early on, when you're thinking about operating and starting a, a nonprofit, you need to think very long and hard whether you want to be a for profit or a nonprofit. And you want to define your reasons. And the wrong reason. Bob and I are suggesting to you for being a nonprofit is to raise or obtain money. If that is your sole purpose, well, I want to be a nonprofit because I want to raise money. Uh, but with uh, that's the wrong reason. The right reason is to organize as a nonprofit to better the community. And yes, you're going to have to raise money, <laughs> but um, but that's the right reason. And over the years, we've had a number, any number of clients who've come in and they really, they really are focusing on being a nonprofit because they, they want to raise money uh, without thinking through the larger purpose. Now, we're also suggesting to you that you incorporate as a nonprofit only if you're going to rely on donations, on government funding, or foundation grants. It, that's because most foundations and many government programs uh, will only make uh, grants or contracts with nonprofits. Not all, but, but many. Um, and donors can only make a tax deductible donation if you are a nonprofit. If you are thinking of, example, trying to run your nonprofit based totally on user fees, and you certainly can charge user fees, but if you're thinking of only doing it on user fees, that doesn't square with the Internal Revenue Service guidelines because they stay, state that charities must obtain at least 30% of their of annual income from public support, and that's donations, in-kind gifts, foundation uh, grants, government grants. We'll, we'll talk more about that as we go through. But um, if, if you're thinking that what your, your business plan suggests that you can get your money by charging user fees and, you, and you're not going to need uh, any kind of a fundraising scheme as in individual donors or foundation grants, our suggestion is incorporate as a for-profit. Uh, you, you'll have a much happier life. And again, as we go through this morning, we'll uh, have more information of why that is so. Now, there are, four, there are advantages of being a nonprofit. One of them is, uh, of course, uh, tax exemption, because nonprofits don't pay federal, state, or local taxes. They don't pay sales taxes. They don't pay corporate taxes. Uh, if you're a nonprofit, then your donors can um, deduct their donations. Their nonprofits are eligible for uh, grants from foundations and, the, and government entities. Um, and in general, 
Uh, nonprofits uh, have lower costs because they tend to pay their people less and because they tend to um, uh, look for the least expensive way of doing things. But nonprofits have to pay some kind of taxes, and those include local assessments. If uh, the building that you occupy needs new sidewalks or needs the street repaired, then uh, you can be assessed for that. Um, you have to pay Social Security, Medicare, and workers' compensation and unemployment taxes, and you must withhold um, employee income tax and remit that to the IRS on a regular basis. Now, there are disadvantages to being a nonprofit, and some of those include loss of control. And the, um, again, we'll say more about that as we go through, but um, you have more freedom to operate as a for-profit than you do as a nonprofit. You have limited purpose. You have, you have to state, set out to both the state and to the federal government what your purpose is. And if you decide later that you want to do something diff, you know, substantially different, you'll probably have to reincorporate or at least amend um, th various items like your articles of incorporation. Your lobbying activities are going to be limited. We'll talk more about lobbying later, but um, you can certainly lobby the local, federal, and state governments, but your activities in those regard are quite a bit limited by, because of being a nonprofit. Everything you do as a nonprofit is going to be subject to public scrutiny and transparency. You have to have board meetings. You have to have um, uh, you have to file tax returns. You don't pay tax, but you have to file tax returns, um, and those uh, returns are subject to public disclosure. Uh, and in fact, there are websites that have virtually every tax return filed. You can go on and look at any nonprofit's return that you want. You see what their expenses are, what their, uh, how, where their revenue came from, where, where they got their, the bulk of their money. Um, and some people are very uncomfortable about that kind of transparency. Um, so that's a, a disadvantage. And the reporting requirements for nonprofits are substantially more extensive than required for for-profits. Um, they're just, uh, there are just a lot more reports and forms that you're gonna have to fill out. Um, that's not to say that, that that should be discouraging any of you. It just means that's a fact of life. Yes. Let's say, going back to that slide. Right. Cleveland Foundation. Yes. Right. They, Cleveland, they did with Arlington. Yes. What can I make them tell me that in terms of their activities? You can go on a, a website called guidestar.org. Guidestar.org. Or in, and type in the name Cleveland Foundation and it will show you what their expenses are, what their revenue has been, and because it's a public foundation, it will show where all the money came from. And where it goes. And, yeah, and, and who they made grants to. You mean the, the, well, you mean you're talking about? Arts Council, Arts Council and Arts Council of Cleveland. Okay, like the Ohio Arts Council, they make grants to nonprofit. Ohio Arts Council, a nonprofit. Yes, and it makes and it makes well, no, the Ohio Arts Council is part of the state government, but it makes makes grants to nonprofit arts organizations. Yes. Can we be addressing audits? Yes. <laughs> because you will have to, you have to. Right? Yeah. Just that when you say nonprofit reporting requirements, I'm just wondering if I hear about what an audit looks like. Sure. We'll talk more about that later, but yes, we, we, an audit is not absolutely required, but most foundations won't make grants unless you have a, 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 an audit performed by, 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 at least, a C, at least a CPA. Now, you don't need to go to one of the big, great big audit firms, but, um, but, you, but it, again, that goes back to the whole thing of transparency. Yes, someone, yes. Do, do nonprofits pay real estate taxes? 
No. No. Now, nonprofit organizations have to follow the same kind of thing, some of the same kind of things that for profit organizations follow. Example, uh, if you're, depending on what kind of a facility you're running, uh, you probably are going to need an occupancy permit. You've, you've got to operate in an area that's zoned for the type of activity you're doing. Uh, you've got to meet federal, local, state, and federal regulations. You can't say, well, I'm a nonprofit, that doesn't apply to me. It does apply to you. Uh, there's no, no exemption there. You've got to have uh, local, state, and federal licenses and certifications, again, depending on the kind of nonprofit that you're operating. If, example, if you're serving food, that's got to be in a licensed facility, which means the public health board has to come and inspect and give you a grading. You've got to have industrial type kitchens. Um, it, 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 it's, it's not optional, you have to do that. You have to follow all the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, rules and regulations, the same thing with OSHA, which is the occupational safety people. Um, you have to do it, it's, it's not, not optional. Now, one myth that we, and we've, we already heard it here this morning, uh, well, we don't need to make much money. Um, Bob and I are here to tell you, and this is not just a suggestion, we are just bold faced saying, we're telling you, you've got to make money. You've, you've got to have a profit or surplus. You've got to take in more money than you expend. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not arguable, it's not even discussable. You've got to do it. And the reason you have to do that, uh, first of all, the surplus income has to go back into the services of the organization. It allows you to operate your nonprofit uh, effectively. Um, I'll just give you an example. All my time in public television, um, my budget on a monthly basis was never in balance. There are some months, like especially during pledge months, a lot of income came in. But then we had other months, especially during the summer, where a lot of money went out um, to pay for things like the national PBS service. Um, if we hadn't taken that surplus money and squirreled it away, we never would have been able to cover our low revenue months. And this will affect all of you as well. You get a, you get a big grant from somebody and say in March, and wow, things look great. By August, the money's gone. And how, you know, how are we gonna keep operating? How are we gonna pay our people? Happy to be, be right with you. Um, the surplus income also allows your nonprofit to reinvest in services. So let's say you, you're, you've been going along fine and you see uh, we have an area where we could expand within our basic mission. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, if you've put some money aside, that'll give you the money to start uh, growing into new areas. Abby? Depends on the terms of the grant. Okay. Usually grants come with a fixed term. They, you know, we're, we're giving you a grant on, that it's gonna run from uh, March 1st through February 28th. And you need to expend all that money during that 12 month period. Uh, um, but you have to use it for the purpose uh, for which it was obtained. Now there are several types of grants, and again, later we'll get into this, but in terms of designated funding and non-designated. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, when we get to the financial piece part of this. All right, well that's getting, that's the basic parameters and we're gonna turn it over to Bob now and he's gonna take you through how nonprofits are governed. Thanks, Bill. Any questions on this before I move on? Okay. Pardon me? Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, talk about governing the nonprofit. That's basically about who makes the decisions. Now, this is really critical. Um, invariably, when we do one of these, uh, there are people who want to start a not-for-profit, and they're the founders of this not-for-profit. They have the passion for the cause. And this part always gives them ulcers, so let's get with it. 
Nonprofits are always, without exception, governed by a board of trustees or directors. The term is interchangeable. I think Ohio law uses directors now. They used to use trustees. Somebody decided that we'll mess it up and make them directors. The board represents the community. Think of it as, as your board is in some ways the stockholders. They represent the stockholders of your not-for-profit business. They are the people who try, who do what they can to keep things on the up and up. They set the policies. The board has fiduciary responsibility. And we'll talk a little bit about insurance. The board is responsible for what happens. Now other people can be responsible as well, but in law, the board of trustees has the fiduciary responsibility for the organization. The boards conduct reviews and evaluations of the organization. And we'll talk a bit more about the specifics of that, but ultimately the board is in charge. Now we're going to talk a bit about how that structure looks. The difference between the structure of a, of a for-profit board and the structure of a not-for-profit board. Sir, could I ask you a question? Sure. So if a board is clueless, what can the public do? Well, um, not a lot other than to raise a lot of questions publicly and so forth. The board makes its decisions, and uh, unless they're doing something illegal, um, there's not a whole lot anybody can do about it. Uh, hopefully you can convince the one or another competent person on the board that something's got to be done. We'll talk about things that help with that, like term limits and so forth. Okay, this is a structure of a for-profit board. You're going to see it's very simple. Whether, whether you're dealing with a very small company or a very large for-profit company that's privately held, as opposed to a stock-held company. You've basically got Little Tot's Daycare, and Jane Goodmom is the owner of this business. So the law says Jane's got to have a board, so she becomes the president and her husband becomes the secretary treasurer. That's their board. Maybe their daughter, son joins them, but that's the board. Jane, the owner, runs the business. She's the owner operator. She hires and fires employees. She decides what they want to do. She decides where they're going to be. She decides what people will be paid. She decides whether they're going to have supplemental programs. She decides whatever she wants to decide about that business. If she wants to start another part of the business, she just does it. She does whatever she wants because she is the for-profit owner. Now that's true. We use the example of Acme. It's true of Acme. The owners of Acme close to the held business, decide what they're going to do. And nobody can tell them anything about it. And they don't have to tell anybody much about their business. On the other hand, the little tykes daycare look a little bit more complicated already. Jane Goodmom is the founder. And she has to have a board of trustees. And that board includes maybe, who knows how many, but at least a president, vice president, sometimes secretary, treasurer, join together, whatever. That's the board, maybe three other people. Maybe it's a board of seven. That board makes all the decisions, all the policy decisions. Jane doesn't, and so far we haven't heard from Jane, have we? Got a board of trustees that's making the decisions. Jane's the founder, but we haven't heard from her yet. The board hires an executive director, which may or may not be Jane Goodmom. The board hires the executive director, the person who runs the company day to day. 
And Jane, or whoever the director is, hires the other employees. Now this is really critical. So are they, let's get questions out of the way if there are any. Yes? Pardon me? No, employees are not board members. Yes? We're going to talk about that. It's three in Ohio. We're going to talk about that. Hopefully they're not. Let's move on. The number, at least three. Basically, you want a num enough board members to do the work of the corporation. You got to make it, the board has to make a decision about that. If you're setting it up, you'll see you have to make a decision about initially about how many board members are going to be. That's in your bylaws, which you're going to have to develop before you get your federal designation as a not-for-profit. And you want an odd number. You don't want six board members and they always end up voting 3-3 three, because three, you can't get anything done. You want, you want an odd number, 3, 5, 7, 9. Board member size are, varies. Some boards are very small, some are very large. I've seen boards as large as 45, 50 people. It depends what your objective is. If you're trying to raise money and you've got a huge population to reach, like United Way, they tend to have large boards. Okay, so it depends. You need the number that's important for the size to do what you want to do. No relatives. Now this is not a law. But in our wisdom, and somebody said, we know everything about not-for-profits. In Bill's and my wisdom, don't get relatives on the board. Disaster waiting to happen. Guaranteed, write a book about it. It's going to happen. No relatives and no friends unless they can really give you something you can't get somewhere else. Now I'm talking friends, like the people you go to lunch with, the people you have coffee with, the people you drink with in social hour, those kinds of people. Now if you know a guy or a gal and you're pretty friendly with them, that's a different thing. But your close friends, the people you really associate with, don't put them on your board. Friends can become enemies real quick. You get relatives, you have bring your sister-in-law on and you're, she gets a divorce from your brother, whoa, you know? It's, you just don't do it. The one thing you do want to do, and this goes to your question about how you can control boards, is term limits. There should be a limit as to how long board members will serve. Now in our area, boards serve two, three terms, maybe three-year terms, two, three-year terms and then they're out, at least for a year. What happens is you get a good turnover. You want new ideas. Innovation, innovation comes from new ideas. If you have the same board for 30 years, you're not gonna have any innovation. So you want people to rotate off. So let's say you have a board of nine you're setting up your not-for-profit. You have a board of nine. You set it up so that every year three of those people go off the board. So you don't get a rush of new people, but you have some turnover. So in a three-year term, all nine people will have been re-elected or off the board. Okay? Expectations of good, member, good board members. Remember the cause? Nonprofits exist for a cause. You want people who are committed to that cause, the mission of your organization. Now they don't have to know it deeply, they just have to, have to be committed to it. And people can learn that commitment. But you want people you know can do that. They have to be willing to give their, of their time, talent, and money. If they don't themselves give, which you hope they will, and even if they do give, you'll hope they'll be able to influence others so that other people give. Other people make decisions that are beneficial to your organization. You want influential people. 
You want community, people with community contacts. It's really important to get people who have a knowledge of not-for-profit organizations. There's a big, big difference, lots of differences, in the day-to-day -day operations of for-profits and not-for-profits. It really helps if some of your board members, at least, have a good understanding of how not-for-profits work. And we'll talk about getting board members in a bit. That sounds so much like a utopia. Well, it's not. So you have examples of good boards with board members? Which yeah, I worked for 30 years for one. I thought we had a good board all the time. They held me accountable. Uh, they were willing to look at new things. They had vast experience in not-for-profits. Uh, Bill had good board members. You don't stay in an organization very long if you've got a crummy board. Because remember, they're hiring and firing you. <laughs> no, he, he, good boards, there are lots of good boards in Akron. Goodwill's got a good board. United Disabilities got a good board. Lots of good boards in Akron. On and on and on. You want board members who are willing to learn and willing to raise money. So you want people who are going to give you a leg up. What are their duties? Again, they govern the organization by establishing agency policies, goals, and objectives. Uh, so, the, so you need people who are going to work. This isn't something that happens just because they're on the board. Developing policies and goals can be very difficult time-consuming. They hire and fire the executive. So if you're the founder, again, if you're the founder of an organization, understand that your board of trustees can fire you if you're the executive. They hired you, they can fire you. They set your salary. Now, goals, they establish policy goals and objectives. The board needs to set up annual goals and objectives for the operation of the organization. And they, they do that with the director, and then they hand this to the director and expect that director to implement this set of goals and objectives. So they not only establish those, but then they evaluate the performance of the executive based on whether she has conformed, completed, work toward the accomplishment of those goals and objectives. It's a tough job. It's one that's ongoing. Um, but if your organization is going to succeed, it needs to do those two things and regularly do that. Decisions of the board are collective. Sometimes we see boards uh, where the executive committee of the board is all powerful. I hate executive committees not people, the committee, because they, they tend to take over when, in fact, collective decisions are made by the board. The entire board is to make the decisions, not a few people. Now, how do you select board members? Remember, they're going to make the rules, so you want to be careful about how you do this. Initially, Whoever is writing this is going to be, have a big, big part in selecting the board members. Later, the board may or may not involve the executive. Hopefully, they do. But pick the first ones carefully, and as you go along, try to be consistent getting your board to pick carefully board members. The board is the ultimate boss, hires and fires the executive, so make sure you do it well. You can't get rid of the board. You can't get rid of any board member. Only the board can do that. And they have to do it consistent with what is written in the organization bylaws. Avoid conflicts of interest. Um, you don't want people on your board serving there so that their business can prosper. Um, if you own real estate, uh, you may have a realtor on your board to help you evaluate, but that realtor shouldn't be your realtor. If you're buying insurance, you can have insurance member, 
on your board, but that those persons shouldn't be your, your insurance men. You need every year, at least, I've been on boards, I'm on a board right now, that every board meeting, there's a disclaimer, a disclosure process, where based on the agenda, are there any conflicts? And those have to be identified. Uh, organizations will have once a year a questionnaire that goes out to the board. Are there any, con do you have any conflicts of interest with what the business is of this organization? You want full disclosure of that. Those people can be on your board, but they must uh, recuse themselves from issues related to their business if they're involved. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay. You want to find people, who do you get? You want to find people who are going to help you. These are some. You don't have to have any of these. You don't have to have all of them. But these are some ideas. You want people with knowledge of accounting and that person is not your auditor. We'll talk about audits in a minute. But you accountants, lawyers, bankers, uh, marketing people, public relations people. Um, one of the things to look for when you're looking for board members, you may find a very fine attorney or banker. Can they come to the meetings? Really important. You'll find that sometimes people are willing to serve, but then they find out they can't attend your meeting, so they're not serving. Make sure, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Public relations people, insurance people, business people, mentors and advisors. Involved community volunteers, often, often overlooked. People may not be business people in the sense that they've run a business, but they may be very, very smart and very knowledgeable about what's going on. I have found through the years invaluable assistance from those kinds of board members. Community volunteers. Um, let me go back here. We don't, I don't think we have a slide on this. Recruiting volunteers. Recruitment is really important. I'm going to digress here for a minute because I thought of this. Recruitment is really important. Um, you want to make sure when you're recruiting somebody that you meet personally with them. If you're the director, you want to make sure that someone on your board meets personally with them, preferably with you at some point. Outline your organization clearly so they know who you are, how you operate. Make sure they understand when you meet and for how long and how frequently. Um, people need to understand what they're getting into, how long you expect them to be with you and what you expect from them. If you have an expectation that every board member is going to contribute dollars to your organization, make sure they understand that before they agree to come on the board and what the extent of that is. Very, very important. You may meet with people who say, I love what you do, but I, I just can't do it. I'd love to do it, I'd love to help you, but I, I can't do it. And that's why it's very important to talk openly, candidly with them. From that number of board that you pick and you choose and the board elects, you pick, you, the board picks officers. The board will pick uh, a president, a vice president, usually a secretary and or treasurer. Um, officers who have specific duties that are outlined in your bylaws. Um, and if you want to get things done, you probably want a committee structure. If you have a board of nine, you don't want all nine people talking about everything. It's a way, you know, it's too time consuming for everybody. So you have committees. The three key committees are finance and audit, planning and evaluation, and nominating. Every not-for-profit should have, in our opinion, should have these three committees. Finance and audit, planning and evaluation, and nominating. And they should all meet. 
problem with nominating is people want to wait until a month before the annual meeting to have a nominating committee meeting, then it's way too late. You can also have other committees. We call them operating committees. Committees dealing with the day-to-day -day operations of the organization, like public relations, marketing, fundraising. Some agencies, many agencies have personnel committees, even though that is a function that the director has responsibility for personnel issues, you need to make sure your policies are in order, personnel policies, so forth. So a committee can be very important there. You want to define in writing the role of each member of the board the role of each committee, the role of each staff member. You want to define the role of the officers in your bylaws. President's responsible for this, this, this. Secretary's responsible for this, this, this. And you want to make sure that the board establishes personnel policies. How often do boards meet? Well, the law says boards have to meet once a year at a minimum. That's the annual meeting. Um, you're not going to have a very effective organization if that's the only time they meet. We recommend that at a minimum the board meet four times a year, quarterly. At a minimum. Depending on the organization and what you're doing, you may meet monthly. Our organization's been in existence 100 years. The board meets monthly. Um, so, it's up to you and your board as to how long you should meet, but uh, quarterly at, at a minimum. Uh, you need to establish the date, time, and place and make that a regular date, time, and place so that people can plan. The third Tuesday of every month at 4 o'clock, third Wednesday of every month at lunch, whatever. And when you have a board meeting, you want to make sure there's an agenda and there are materials supporting that agenda, that that information is distributed to your board at least a week prior to your meeting. You don't want board members coming to the board meeting being presented with a pile of material that they haven't seen. You expect them to approve a budget and they've never seen it? You just can't do that and you'll lose board members. You'll lose them real fast. Bill? Are there any questions on all that? Yes. So, I'm not, I'm not even sure how to frame my question, but and it, it might be a combination of me trying to develop a new board, sort of which is about five years old, but I can't imagine having people on our board that aren't extremely passionate about what our mission is, because a time bank is I, I don't know your organization. You do, right, Bill? Not, not the way does. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it depends on your organization. Yeah. And it depends on what's working or not working for you. No, they need to understand the mission completely. Yeah, the mission, how it operates, they may not understand, but the mission, they've got to understand. That's hard for me to comprehend to have someone on our board who wouldn't understand how it operates. It would be how it operates? Right. Well, you can teach that, right? One of the things we don't talk about here is when you bring new board members on, you should have an orientation of those board members. And that can be one meeting, that can be several meetings. You can have orientation at every board meeting. You need to provide orientation for your board just as you do for, uh, for your staff. And if you're going to be accredited by any national organization, they're going to require that you have board orientation. So you, you can do it. it, it gets, 
gets difficult maybe, but you want to make sure they understand your mission, though. The mission's the thing that drives everything you do. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Uh, now, as a board member, can I require the executive officers to do things in a systematic way? As a board member? Yeah. I would think you would be working to do that every time you're in a meeting with them. So I can say, as a board member, tell me what you're planning to do. Absolutely. You've got to vote on what they're doing. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Do they carry guns? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's your role. That's what a board member is supposed to do. All right, so you've got your board in place, and now we're going to talk for the next few minutes about how to manage it. Yes. Yes. Let me address something that you just said, and then I'll go to the bigger question. I don't find anything wrong with your executive director saying, don't talk to board members. No. Because if you have a board, and the board is allowed to run roughshod over the executive director and down into the line staff, you've lost control of the organization. Remember, the board hires the executive. The executive hires the staff. The staff reports to the executive, not to the board. And I would, be, I would be not only very nervous about that kind of structure, I've had some experience on nonprofit boards where we, there were some board members that had, let's say, some informal arrangements with the staff, and the staff was saying back to the executive, well, wait a minute, the board has told me to do this. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't work. What? That doesn't sound like that doesn't sound like good management uh, to uh, to do that. But. But. Not really guidelines, but good but good governance suggests you have a an engaged, nominating committee that is actively recruiting good board members from a, a variety of, of people so and, it, and they come in and meet the executive director and they have a tour of the organization and the, there's some groundwork established that this would be in fact a really good board member. Yeah, but you know, if these organizations are community supported, mm -hmm. right? Yes. They don't pay taxes. Right. Okay, as a board member, you have every right to stand up and say. Right, so she has a right. 
to stand up and say, this is collusionary, it's not working. Well, as a staff member, she doesn't, but as a board member, she does. She's yeah. a board member. Absolutely not. Now, if there, if there is a feeling of some kind of malfeasance or illegality or something, yes, of course, go to a board member. So like she's saying that the director appoints the board members. No, 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 no. The director does not appoint the, the no. Only the, the board elects board members. Initially, the founder is going to have to put together the initial board of directors. But once the organization is running, it's the board through a nominating committee that comes up with board members and the entire board votes. That's not the executive who does that. The executive may be involved, but, uh, does, but should not control the process. All right, yes, yes. It could be, or, or perhaps not. The, the, the board would have to make that decision. But probably, initially, if the founder has done all the work and recruited the board, there's probably an understanding that the founder is going to be the executive of the, of the organization. But it, and again, it just depends how you're putting things together. Okay? All right. We've got the board in place. Now we have to manage the organization. All right, we're assuming at this point that we've got paid staff. If we don't have paid staff, um, that there's a whole other scenario, but we're talking about that we're, we're, you're able to pay your staff. There's an executive director, a CEO, whatever you want to call the person. That person answers to the board and only to the board. The person does not serve on the board other than ex officio. In other words, the person is in the board meetings, uh, participates in the discussion, but does not vote. Uh, to me, that is a real conflict of interest if you have the executive also voting. And in most boards, they don't permit that to happen. The executive implements the policies that the board has set. And that means that whatever the board eventually determines and passes as a policy, the executive has to implement that policy. It's not arguable about that point. It's not discussable at that point. The executive has to carry that out. If the executive doesn't feel they can carry it out, the executive needs to make that known and perhaps needs to resign. The executive staffs all board committees, or at least has a designee. So all those committees that Bob ran over a few minutes ago, the executive needs to be at every one of those meetings. Uh, implements the agency programs and services, is responsible for all management issues. In other words, doesn't get bucked back up to the board, it's up to the executive to deal with the management of the staff. Conducts and supervises all daily operations. Develops a personnel man manual um, and this may be, getting back to your issue, yeah, the executive probably writes the manual, sends it to the board for their uh, review and discussion and approval, modification, but the board eventually needs to approve the personnel manual. The executive hires and fires all other employees, not the board, the executive. Now, some agency employees may need to be um, uh, certified or have licenses. It depends on what you're doing, but if you like are hiring social workers, they've got to be licensed. Um, you must make sure that everyone that's hired either is a citizen or a documented resident. Um, many of your staff you're going to want to be bonded, in other words, insured, if, especially if they're handling money. Uh, so if there are any kind of irregularities, hopefully there won't be, but if there are, that uh, you have uh, coverage for that sort of thing. You want to make sure you have personal, uh, uh, professional liability insurance uh, uh, so that, I mean, and it's because people sue and you want to make sure that the organization is protected. The executive also makes, needs to assure that all the bills get paid. One of the things that often trips up nonprofits is that uh, some expenses don't get taken care of in a timely uh, manner. And 
um, that can cause real problems down the line if that's not uh, dealt with. Yes. Okay, let's talk about the uh, personnel committee that Bob mentioned earlier, or the nominating committee. The executive just needs to be. They need to be with every one of those yes, absolutely. Yeah, because what you don't want to have happen is the board gets an idea and starts to run with it, and and there's no way in by the executive of the pros and cons of how it would affect daily uh, agency operations, because probably the board is not too aware of exactly how the organization functions on a daily basis. Abby. So you said at the beginning this is for a board that has a pay staff. Right. And then if you don't have a pay staff like our organization, right. it's going to look different. Will you be talking about that or not? Really? Not really. Okay. Um, but because what, but just briefly, the, then the board takes on a lot of those daily operational uh, aspects. So there may still be a board member who's functioning as the executive but is not being paid. And, uh, and that's acceptable because yeah. Oh, yeah. money isn't in the insurance. Right. People don't get all yeah. There are, there are all sorts of nonprofits that run uh, not with paid staff but totally with volunteers. So does it look completely different? Um, yeah, you don't tend to have the, quite the formal structure that, if, that you have when you have paid staff. But so much of the formal structure seems to be very important to yeah. the, having yes. a good working board. Yes, right. Which again, it's why you want to define the duties of everyone so that you don't have people running off thinking they're doing something when in fact the organization really needs to have them doing something else. And it can happen. Now, again, if you're talking about if you have employees, you want to, yes? I just thought that was unbelievable. Where do you find them? What, employees? employees. You recruit them. <laughs> the, same way, the same way any business finds good employees. You recruit them. You, you start out with a, a good, thorough job description of what you want the person to be doing what you want the position to be doing, and what qualifications the person needs to hold to be able to do that position. Um, you want to make sure that you have a salary schedule. You're just not making something up, but you know that um, uh, if you're hiring, let's say, an accountant, that they make, in this area, they make from this amount to this amount if, with certain qualifications, um, so that you, you have the basis of getting good employees. Then once you've got someone, you want to you want to train them. Don't just assume they uh, know what they need to do. You need to train them, and you especially need to communicate the organization's expectations. Um, motivate and lead employees. You as the founder have got the passion and the dream, and you need to make sure that you need that you transition that to every one of your employees. And we, we see nonprofit organizations all the time that the employees walk and talk that dream, that mission. And, and I've seen others, some, some of the employees don't have a clue. Um, and so passing on the passion of the dreams, and having every employee know what the mission is, is really important. But the employees can be volunteers, right? Well, no. Employees are considered paid. Right. There's no money going around. Right. Then, about, then, you, then, there, then, the, then those positions can be, they're considered to be performed by volunteers. Right. Right. So they aren't paid. But they should still have position descriptions and qualifications and, if they, and, and evaluations. And if they aren't performing, they need to be either uh, shown what is lacking and allowed to make the correction or they need to be eased out. Yeah, but in the real world, that's hard. No, I'm sorry. It's not hard. And that's how every business in the country runs, every good business. Yeah, but this is not for profits, right? Not for profits are businesses. Remember going back to almost the first slide? Right. Okay. If, if you were considering running your non nonprofit, anything other than a business, I've got to say, stop right now. You won't be successful. And I say that, and Bob will echo it based on, between us, Bob, what, 60 to 70 years of experience in working for nonprofits. Yeah, he said seven. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> okay, so uh, your policies. Make sure that they're written down, uh, that they're approved by your board. Um, 
make sure that all, they all have procedures for impl implementation. The board passes the policy, but there's, you have procedures for how you're going to implement them. Um, who's responsible for doing the implementation? Make sure that, you're, um, that the policy is dated so everyone knows when it was adopted. And again, you'll want to reflect that in the board minutes uh, of when the policy was adopted and what it was. Now, finances. This can also trip up a lot of nonprofits. Any money that your nonprofit uh, has access to must be in, separate from any of your personal money. No exceptions. A separate checking account, a savings account, it's separate. It's in the name of the organization, not in your name, but the name of your organization. They're not personal accounts. Your finance committee of your board will oversee the organization's finances. There'll be your treasurer will provide regular reports to the finance committee. And the executive or the CEO, or perhaps if you're a very large organization, maybe you've got a, uh, a chief financial officer or something similar, they'll prepare a budget for review by the board. But you're, I don't care what size of nonprofit you're running, you've got to have an, a, an annual budget. You've got to. Otherwise, the money comes in and it kind of goes out and no one knows where it's gone. You, you've got to have that annual budget and it needs to be approved by the board. You can certainly modify it as you go through the year, but uh, you, you need, uh, you need a, a, an annual budget. Again, um, your finance committee meetings, as with all committee meetings, you're going to want uh, minutes that are written. Um, again, the organization has to operate within its budget. The executive has to assure it. The board must review it and affirm it. You, you can't spend more money than you take in. You just can't. Now, there were several questions early on about the need for an audit. Um, it's really important that you have uh, an audit performed of your, non, of your nonprofit by an outside accountant that's chosen by the board, by the board, because it turns out to be the board's audit. And this, when it's the audit's complete and it's been, been reviewed by the board, this then is something that you can share with the community because people, especially donors, may want to see your audit. Now, there's not an absolute legal requirement that you do an audit, but again, most foundations won't provide funding unless you've got an audit. Um, there are ways of doing less than a full audit, maybe not every single year if you're a smaller organization. Um, and that's something you can think about. Uh, but again, when you, you get above a certain scale and, you, and you're trying to go for larger amounts of money from foundations, uh, they're really going to uh, want to see an audit. Abby? So when you say get above a certain scale, yeah. are you talking about having $10,000 in a bank account? No. It, no, it's more like what are you, you know, where are you getting your, how's your money coming in? And like if you're planning to go out to foundations or, govern, or government entities, that's when I would start doing an audit. So even a few thousand dollars, they still might want to see. But they still might, in, yeah, out. they still might want to, but you, but you could just get a, a CPA to do um, kind of an overview audit, maybe not in the kind of depth that you would do with a full audit. And it will cost you a lot less money. It depends. No, it depends. It just depends. No, well, I would think maybe in thousand, but a thousand, a thousand or so for a small organization. But I'm not an expert in audits. I mean, in terms of that. Yes. Now, when you're doing your budget, here are some typical expenses that you would want to consider. Not every organization will have every one of these, but if you're paying salaries, uh, if you have benefits, that's, those are budget lines. Um, are, you, are you occupying a building? Uh, if so, there's rent, uh, insurance and legal uh, costs, public relations, marketing, accounting, auditing, your program and operations. In other words, what are you spending to actually run your program? And one that a lot of organizations often forget is fundraising because it costs money to raise money. Don't think that you can 
just raise money and it won't cost you anything because it will cost you. Uh, even if you're doing it in email, there's a cost. Uh, but if you, as an example, if you're doing a benefit dinner um, and you think you can sell 100 places uh, at so much money and 100% and of that revenue goes right to the organization, no, because you've got to subtract for the cost of renting the hall, pro providing the food, uh, the invitations, all of that sort of stuff. So it could be that you're doing a benefit dinner, but 50% of the revenue really ends up in the organization. It, uh, it just depends. All right, we've been at this nearly 90 minutes, and we did promise you a break halfway through. So let's take a 10-minute break and come back at, let's say, 5 after 11, and Bob will take you through how Nonprofits are financed, and that'll include a good piece on how to raise money.
All right, um, we ought to start. We're, we're better than halfway through, really, so this is what you all came for anyway, I suspect. So lots of questions. Don't worry about interrupting. Let's make sure we cover what you want us to cover. Financing. It's important to understand the um, different kinds of income sources that non-for-profits might have. So we'll do an overview and then I'll go through each one rather clearly. Earned income, that's like fees, service fees you might charge to people, income from your investments. Donated income where people, individuals, other people give the nonprofit money. Corporate income, that's similar to donated income, but it's from corporations. Uh, might be contracts that you have with corporations that generate revenue. Foundation grants. Um, government income, there are two types of government income we'll get into, contracts and grants. Um, and other income like crowdfunding, uh, special events, in-kind, things like that. I need to take a course in crowdfunding because I don't know a lot about that. You can teach me that. <laughs> okay, let's take them one at a time here. Um, earned income. These are fees charged to people who receive the benefit of your service. Um, it's just like charging for, normally it's, in a, in a sense, it's just like charging for a product in the open market. You charge a fee based on your costs. I'll complicate it just a little bit. In the not-for-profit world where you may have uh, clients who have varied income, some of them having no income or little income, you might do what many nonprofits call a sliding fee scale. Based on income, the, the cost to the participant either increases or decreases. It gets complicated. It's a real bear to administer, but it's very important for certain service sectors. And you want to estimate, when you do your budget, you want to estimate, if you're charging fees, how much you think you might generate from those fees based on um, how many people are going to access them, how many times, it, what the cost is, et cetera, et cetera. If your organization is designated as a 501c3 charity um, by the IRS, uh, you must register first with the Ohio Attorney General in order to raise money. So $25, I think, it's not a big deal, but it is an annual registration. And you might be required to register in the city or county in which you live to raise money. Uh, you need to check that based on where your organization is housed and where you're raising money. There are two types of donated funds. Uh, we're going to use two terms for each one. Designated or restricted or undesignated or unrestricted. Now the difference really isn't all that complicated if you think about it. I'm a donor, I'm going to give money to you. I can either give you that money and say I want it to be used for this, designate the use of it, or I want to give it to you and say use it forever is best for the organization. I'm not designating it. I'm not restricting its use. Designated is restricted unrestricted, undesignated. It is important because when you do your audits, if you have a, a significant amount of designated donations, you've got to make sure you can verify that those donations are being used for the purpose designated. Any question on that? So default is undesignated. Right? If what is undesignated? Correct. I give you money. Correct. You're free to use it anyway. 
Right. If by default it's undesignated, unless you designate it, it's undesignated. Correct. Okay. And that designation lasts forever. You can't just take it away. Okay. Then there are general operating donations, which are basically undesignated, but when you get to foundations, we'll see that some foundations will not give money for general operating. Okay? Which gets us into an accounting, and we don't really spend any time on accounting in not-for-profits, but it's important to understand that not-for-profit accounting is different from for-profit accounting. And you need an accountant who understands that, okay? And you want to estimate, again, the annual amount of donations you expect to get, particularly from individuals, from foundations, etc. Now, when you get donations, particularly from individuals, all donations need to be, you need to be acknowledging those donations. Thank you for your donation. Any donation greater than $250 must not only be acknowledged by letter, but you must state in that letter that phrase that's up there. Nothing was given or received in exchange for the donation. If the donation is in excess of $250, you must identify that in the letter. Because remember this Donation is going to be used by the donor for tax purposes. Now, let's assume you have a fundraising event that includes dinner, and you charge $100 for that. The dinner costs you $40. That $40 is deducted from the donation in terms of what was tax deductible because something was given for that $40. Dinner was given. So the, donor, the donation amount is $60, though the individual gave you 100 Is that clear? And when a lot of not-for-profits now, and I think all should, when they have such events, they will usually say, here's the, the amount is a golf outing or whatever. Here's the amount the charge is, is $100, the amount that is tax deductible is 60, right on the invitation to attend. And information on donation is public information. It's public, as is just about everything non for profits do. Foundation grants. It's something everybody needs to understand it's something every not-for-profit should be aware of and try to access, but you can't run an organization on foundation grants solely. Um, it, it's just not gonna happen in the long run. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. One is that most foundation grants are one-time gifts. They may give you $30,000 today, but they have no guarantee you're going to get $30,000 next year or five years from now or ever. If they give you $5,000 today, maybe the only $5,000 you ever see from them. So you have to, let's say you get the $30,000 and you need fifty, dollars and you get the other twenty, dollars and now next year you need sixty. dollars Where are you going to get it in the following year? If it's all foundations, you're on pretty soggy ground. It's not going to happen very quickly. Foundations always require a written proposal or request, usually in a format developed by the foundation. And you want to follow their format. If they say, give us five copies of stuff, if they say, tell us your mission, you do it. You don't say, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, do it and do it in the format they ask for it. Most often a written report, once you've gotten a grant from them, a written report on what you did with the grant is frequently, particularly with larger foundations, required. You gotta tell them what you did with it. Some of the smaller foundations don't really 
uh, get into that largely because it's, a, it's an administrative cost and they're small, they don't need it. They're more willing to just give you $1,000 or $3,000 without having that um, written report. But in any case, you want to get back to them anyway and thank them and you know do all that good stuff. Foundation grants may or may not require publicity. Uh, and sometimes their publicity is not wanted. But more and more foundations are, are doing their own publicity. But they like it when you do yours too. Okay, writing a proposal. Bill and I, in our experience, 20% success rate is a good success rate. Now that will improve over time as people get to know you, as you get to know them, et cetera, et cetera. But you need to be aware that just because you ask for money, you may not get it. And you may not get what you ask for. So a success rate, you, not, you need to think that when I'm writing these proposals, I may not get anything. So how do you go about it? Well, the preliminaries are absolutely essential here. You want to develop, before you go to any foundation, a concise uh, package that includes your mission statement, a description of your programs and services, your budgets, and so forth. Because you're going to be writing proposals that may be one page long, they may be 20 pages long, depending on the foundation. So you want to know what you've got and what you can work from. You want to research foundations to find out which foundations are most likely to fund your type of service in your geographic area. Foundations don't, always, don't fund everything. Uh, the Morgan Foundation, for instance, is more likely to fund, if I'm not mistaken, mental health issues, but not social service issues. So you need to know what foundation is going to fund what and in what area. The Morgan Foundation is in Hudson and would prefer to fund a lot of good stuff in Hudson. Doesn't mean they won't fund us elsewhere, but if you're in Hudson, they like it. So you need to know the geographic areas. Then you want to make preliminary contacts with the foundation. Tell them who you are, what you do, and so forth. And the best way to do that is in person. You call somebody up and you say, I'd like to talk about this. Can I come see you? Smaller foundations, they may say, well, let me send you some stuff. Okay, but here's who I am. You want that personal contact. Basically, two things are happening. You're trying to get money. The foundation is trying to give it away. And they have to give it away. So they want people to ask for it. What you want to do is make sure that you're in the, in the queue for it and that they know who you are when that thing appears on their desk. So it's not a surprise. Gee, I never heard of this organization. Oh, I've heard of them. I didn't know they were going to ask for money. Ideally, when that proposal gets there, they know not only who you are, where you are, who you represent, but what you do and what you're asking for money for even before the proposal gets there. You want to request only what you might be granted. If in your research you find out that foundation, the foundation generally funds ten to twenty thousand dollars, don't ask for thirty. Don't ask for fifty. Because they'll just throw it out, most likely. Fund request money in the within the scope of what the foundation is capable of giving and usually gives. Now you'll find a range, and that's why it's important to know what their likes are. And looking at their grants, you'll figure it out. This foundation gives to particular colleges, maybe 200,000 a year. But they give to social services in Summit County anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 a year. You see, there's a wide range, but you can figure out why that is pretty quickly. Assume you'll be given less than you request. If you ask for $10,000, do not assume that if they give you money, that's what you're going to get. Chances are you won't. 
Chances are you'll get something less than that. And you want to, again, follow their, web, their guidelines, which are usually on their website. And if they're not, ask them, do you have any specific guidelines? What do you want in the, what do you want to see in the proposal? Is there a format? Usually it's on their website, where you can find it in some of the resources we'll talk about in a minute. And when you get the money, the grant, you want to be sure to send a letter of thanks Sometimes even if they don't want it, you may want to send a report on what you did with it. If you don't get money, find out why. Maybe they just didn't have enough. Maybe they had many, many more requests for money than, than they were capable of giving. Maybe your proposal didn't quite cut it. Maybe they wanted more statistical information than you gave. Lots of reasons, but ask, they'll tell you. Because again, they want to help people get their money. Um, so they're, they're willing to share that information. The other thing to remember is that when you request money from Foundation A, then you're going to request money from Foundation B and C, all of those foundations are likely to know you're asking the other foundation for money for the same thing you're asking them. They talk. They really do. They not only talk at one time, and I think it's probably still true, they meet regularly to see what's happening. So don't be afraid to share information about, honestly, about what you're trying to do. If you're asking money for, a, if you're trying to raise $50,000 and you're asking 10 foundations for that money, share that. Some foundations will ask you, right up front, what other foundations have you approached for this money? So don't be afraid to give it to them. That's the, that's the process right there of getting the money once you know who you're going to. It's not complicated. It's a lot of hard work, but it's not complicated. Questions? OK. Now, foundations. Local foundations will vary in size. Um, from very small to very large. Um, and as a result, their grants vary in size from very small to very large. Um, if, you're a, if you're an organization that's not very well known, the chances of getting large grants are rather small. Um, if you don't have a proven track record, your chances may be smaller. If your mission is really hot, something that they really want, they may come after you and with big numbers because they won't like what you're doing. At that point, it's really important for you to produce. Larger grants up to $25,000, $30,000 usually go to well-established organizations. So I'm saying newer, smaller organizations have a tougher time getting those large grants. And the largest grants in excess of 30 are usually given to large, very visible projects. Now that's changed. These figures are a little older. I'm noticing that their, their money is a little, the grants are a little larger than when we did this. Yes? I've, I've not seen any, no. and it's probably going to be very different, I mean, one, one organization to the next, yeah. Now, national foundations, um, it's not likely that they're going to fund uh, a startup organization unless it's part of a particular project they have going. Uh, like the Knight Foundation just recently in Akron. I think some of those are new projects. I'm not real tight on that, but I, I think that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what they wanted to do. Uh, unless you have something like that, national foundations aren't looking for the smaller organizations to fund. 
they're not necessarily even looking for large organizations in our area unless the issue is one that they're really involved with. I'm talking Ford Foundation and things, uh, the uh, Newman Foundation and things like that. They usually found, fund very large projects with a national or regional impact. The one, the one exception is Knight, and even they have begun to really target specific things. The difference with Knight, the reason Knight is more likely to fund something in Akron is because the Beacon Journal was the initial Knight Redder newspaper, the original Knight paper. And they fund in cities where they have Knight Ritter papers. Okay? Now, how do you find these organizations? How do you find the right foundation? This is a critical slide. Um, you go to the library. <laughs> and in Hudson, we're fortunate because the Hudson has the foundation. Doesn't Hudson have the Foundation Center materials? Um, you do it through the library, through online searches, printed directories. And both the main library in Akron and the Hudson Library have access to everything from the Foundation Center that you can get. Um, the Foundation Center um, is housed across the country and you can buy into that to get access to their information. But it's very expensive. Now, if you know a foundation, say the Akron Community Foundation, you can go to their website, foundationctr.org. You can go to their website, and it'll allow you to type in Akron Community Foundation, and you can get their 990. But you can't really search for foundations yourself, you have to do that at either the Hudson Library or downtown Akron Library. And you go to those libraries and you ask for help, and they will guide you through the process of researching foundations. Um, now, when you research, what are you looking for? You're looking for the size of the foundation. You're looking for what they fund, where they fund it. If they fund in Ohio, but all of their grants are in Franklin County, and they say Franklin, then don't apply to them. If, they're, if their service, their description of what they fund doesn't fit your organization, go on. Um, now, a lot of that information you can get from their 990, which is their tax report. It's their tax return. It'll tell you who they are, where they are, what they fund, who to apply to, and it will give you a list of all of the organizations that were funded in that year and the amount that was given to those organizations. So you can get, from the 990, you can get everything you need, including, and I skipped this, the proposal guidelines and format. It's all there. Submission deadlines. So they will say, we well, meet quarterly, um, information to be in by March 31st, et cetera, et cetera. Meet once a year in December, information to be submitted before November 1st, something like that. The other source that is equally as good, maybe better even, is GuideStar. GuideStar also gives you access to the 990s. It's easy to access. You just go to guidestar.org and, and follow the, the information to get to the foundations. Now, this is the most important thing you've got to do is research these folks. It's the most time consuming. It's the thing that is not really that f much fun to do, but it's really important. Uh, simply, well, simply Google the Foundation Center and you'll get it. But it's, I believe it's uh, foundationctr.org. 
Okay? All right. What did I do? Put it in my pocket. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing here. Okay, there are other sources of funding that are a little harder to get to and find. Um, but again, you can find these through the Foundation Center, through the search process in the library. There are a lot of little foundations that you've never heard of in Akron, in other places. They're generally managed by banks by trust departments in banks. And they're really nice. They're, once you know them, they're easy to access. Uh, they generally re take a very short proposal, a page or two, um, and you can get 1,000, 3,000, 5,000, 8,000, 10,000 from some of them. But again, the process is the same. Once you find out where they are, you need to call the trust officer or whoever's in charge of them, talk to them about that, found, that foundation, that trust, and whether your organization is appropriate for it and what the guidelines are. I did that recently for SCORE. One of the foundation people sent me information on five different foundations, one of which I never asked for. So don't be afraid to uh, to go to those. They're, they're very easy to access. They're very helpful. Um, they like what people do. You would find them in the library researching through the Foundation Center, foundations in the northern Ohio area or in Ohio. Just foundations. They'll come up. I think you might. Yeah, would you search bank trusts? Might. But I think they'll just come up as, as foundations. The only way you might even know there are a bank trust is you're applying through Key Bank or somebody. Okay? The other place is um, the news. Um, the larger foundations, especially in our area, publicize their grants in the newspaper. Uh, so look for them, and they they publish all of them. The other place is event programs. You go to Blossom, they have a program there. It doesn't tell you much about what's going on, but it tells you about everybody who gave them money. You go to the go to E. J. Thomas. You go to any event. There's a program, and the donors are always listed. You go to a high school fundraiser and the donors are always listed. You want to save those. You want to have a collection of event programs because they'll tell you who's giving money. And after a while, you know which ones to get rid of. And, and you come back and you go to your computer and you go to the foundation center and you type in the name of somebody who gave to the... To the uh, Cleveland Orchestra, and you find out, well, they only fund in Cuyahoga County. Or no, they've got grants to organizations in Summit County. That's how you do it. It's a lot of work. Okay, normally what you include in your proposal is a description of your organization. Very quick, short description, paragraph long, of who you are and what you do normally. Then the same kind of description about why you were asking for money. What is the money going to be used for? What's your project? What is your request for? To do what? And how much money are you requesting? Explain the, the anticipated benefit and then send that information along with the number of copies that they want. Uh, no more, no less. Your IRS letter of determination, the letter you get from IRS that says you're a 501c3, you send that. And do not send anything else unless they ask for it. They'll mostly say they do want an audit, some financial statement. 
But don't send them material they don't want. It's cumbersome, it's bulky, they'll throw it away anyway. Instead of sending them the material, what you want to do is talk to that person at the foundation and let that person answer questions. That person becomes an advocate for you. When the, when the foundation meets, let's take the Akron Community Foundation. It has an allocation committee. Maybe it's 10 people, maybe it's five people. They sit down in a room with all the proposals. Difficulty is those proposals have already been reviewed by staff. Some of them never get to that allocation committee. So you want to make sure that staff person knows things are coming in so you get the, to the allocation committee. That staff person is going to be in that room so when the allocation committee has questions about your proposal, there's somebody there who can answer those questions. That's why you want to be real good friends with somebody from the foundation. Yes? Um, when is an appropriate time to start that relationship with someone at the foundation? So like do a like meeting if maybe before you start like maybe your developer and business plan? Is it a good idea to like have coffee with someone from the foundation or do a write yourself thing you want to establish before you talk with them and develop that relationship? Yes. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it depends. If you know what you're going to do, you're really locked into this, and you have some idea of how much money you're going to need, and you know that that foundation is going to be a key, then you start it as soon as you can. Um, and one of the reasons for that is you may find out when you have that meeting that they're not going to fund you for any reason because there are two or three other people doing that exact same thing that you may not have been aware of. It is a good way to find out where you're going to fit. We'll talk about some of this in a little bit, but it does help, yeah. So I wouldn't be bashful. I would, normally I guess I'd wait a little bit till I was further along in the process. But you might do it as a um, to find out where you're going to fit in the mix of everything as you're developing the organization. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It never hurt. It can't hurt. Can't hurt. Yes. So this IRS letter, I mean, don't you just send them the number, or do no. you need to send the letter? Yes. Send them a copy. Yes. The number won't do it. They want to see it. They want to see that that number is that you are that number. Mm -hmm. When you're researching foundations, you want to make sure you get their legal name, address, and phone number so you can get to them, their website. You want to be precise when you ask for money. You want to use their legal name. You don't want to be sloppy about it and give them half the name. Uh, the contact person information, we've covered a lot of this. Area of interest, focus of grants and types of projects considered. Type of recipients eligible for grants. There may be some restrictions on that. Uh, some religious-based organizations will only fund a particular religious uh, group of persons, etc. Geographic limits. Type of support considered. Remember I said before some foundations won't fund operating money, general operating? They'll tell you that. You want to find out. Some will fund capital improvements, some will not. Uh, scholarships, um, single year grants. Um, you want to look at how, many, how much money they've distributed in the last year or two and what size those grants were. The calendar deadlines, application guidelines. And the last one you want to look at on the 990 is the list of important people. Not just who you write to, but who's on their board, 
because you might know them or someone on your board may know them. So as you work through this process, um, you, you say to your board, we're writing to the ABC Foundation and here are the people on the board. If anybody knows them, let me know. And when we do our request, we'll try to coordinate when a good time for you to talk to that person is. So you talk to that person and you say, you know, we're considering a request to the foundation for this and that. Do you think you can support that? And that person may say, yeah, sure. Send me a copy or some other advice. May have advice on how much to ask for. So that's a imp really important item to be looking for. There are things called challenge grants. You may request um, $20,000 and get a grant of 10, contingent upon you raising the other 10. That's a challenge grant. Challenge is I'll give you money if you show me that you're able to raise the rest. Challenge grant. Um, these are becoming more and more common, especially with the larger foundations. I, I don't know how to predict when, when you might see one or when you won't. It may be the project they're interested in but don't want to fully fund. It may be that they're not sure about your organization doing this project. Uh, there's a very famous, very large foundation, Kresge, out of uh, Kansas that funds only capital. But their deal is when you, when you request money from them, they're not interested in giving you money only if you can prove to them that you've got in place or are building in place a substantive, workable basis of raising money in the future. So they may say, we'll give you $100,000, but it's contingent on this, this, and this, and unless you can show them that you're doing that, you'll never see a dollar. Their thing is to help people raise money and do good things, but they want to help people put themselves in a place to really be able to raise money. Okay? Contracts, uh, of whether contracts, whether private or government, are different from grants. Contracts are just what they s sound like. We have an agreement that for this, we'll pay you this. If your organization does A, B, C, D, and F, we'll pay you this amount of money. So they may say, we'll give you a contract for $50,000, but you don't get a check for $50,000. With a grant from a foundation, they send you a check. Here it is. Grants, uh, contracts, you, you have to, you're basically being paid, it's a fee for service basically. You provide the service, we'll reimburse you. Uh, they're time limited uh, and may not be renewable. Um, they, they can be real helpful because they can be renewable sometimes and it provides you an ongoing amount of money for a while. That's the possible upside. Just like foundation requests, they always demand a written proposal and they send you a request for proposals, an RFP, um, usually that you have to follow. Sometimes they require attendance at a meeting prior to giving you the request for proposals. When you get them, uh, and you provide the service, you got to have in your head the fact that you provide the service on May 6th, but you're not going to see the money till June or whenever the, the turnaround is for that. Uh, they also contain a list of do's and don'ts, a list of things that you can include in the proposal, in your budget for the project, things you can't include in the budget. Government grants very often do not allow you to include management costs. Um, materials and uh, with government projects, materials that you develop 
sometimes, oftentimes, belong to the entity that's giving you the money. Um, so you need to look at all of those things. What would be an example of that? Medicare, uh, Medicaid. Um, there are some grants for, uh, we had a grant that helped with uh, the purchase of automobiles through a uh, program to help un unemployed people get to work. You find these in the Federal Register, the government ones in the Federal Register. Uh, you can sign up for notice of funding. Uh, there's a lot of money. The difficulty of getting these, there are a couple of, on the government side, difficulty of getting them is, is enormous. Uh, first, they, they, um, government money generally comes in this way. It comes from the federal government to the state government. Yeah, I'm talking Ohio now. And the state government allocate goes to a particular department of the state, and then it very often then it will come to the county or the city. So you may be applying to the city or the county for federal money rather than to the federal government. So you have to watch for what is available in the county and what is available in the city, and they usually publicize that in the newspaper or by talking to people at various county departments. You'll, you'll pick that up. The other difficulty is if you're writing all of these government things, I said they're similar to foundation grants. I was fudging that a little bit. They're similar, but they're a lot more work. A lot more work just in doing the proposal. The federal proposals are enormous. So, but even at the local level, they're, they're a lot of work to get them. Federal, that's why we have here, federal contracts are unlikely. Unless you're a big organization really invested in something that you know is gonna happen, federal grants, don't even think about them. Think about county contracts or, or government con, uh, city contracts are more likely. Uh, as I said, they can be more complicated, but this is where your board comes in again, knowing various political people who like what you're doing, and you say, hey, is there any money available? Now, when you're doing grant writing, it's good to be aware that um, they have different fiscal years. Foundations, it's not such a big deal. It is with government. Um, and these are the fiscal years, the government fiscal years. Um, city, county, uh, February through December. Uh, January, that should be January through December. State is July through June, and federal is October through September. So if you get a federal grant, the fiscal year may be October, you may not get the grant till January the following year. And then you've got to expend it in the next nine months. Unit rates, I thought we dropped this. Isn't this the one we dropped? <laughs> Unit rates, that's just uh, how much the, uh, it costs for a particular thing. The unit, the product is a unit. Okay, any questions on any of that? Well, then we're gonna talk about the nitty gritty of how to do this. Don't put that in your pocket. I won't. <laughs> okay. You've heard some of our thoughts about nonprofits, how they're governed, how they're organized, how they're managed, how you raise money. Okay, how do you set up a nonprofit? Well, in the next few minutes, we'll go through how you actually get started. First of all, start with a blank piece of paper. Don't start with the, with the state and federal form. Start with a blank piece of paper and figure out what is your nonprofit going to do? And how are you going to do it? Where are you going to do it? And for whom are you going to do it? 
And these are really important questions. These are not something you're going to whip off in a night. This is something that you want to spend a good amount of time figuring out because it will determine the success or failure of your organization going, going forward. Um, and have other people have a look at it uh, once you have some good thoughts down on paper. We're not talking about writing paragraphs and paragraphs here. Sometimes even bullet points will do it. But uh, get an idea of your, what, what your nonprofit is going to be doing in terms of its products or its services. Now, before you start filling out all that paperwork with the state and federal government, we strongly success, stress that you prepare a business plan which provides for a solid, unduplicated program to address a pressing community need. And this would include things like a mission statement and your goals and objectives and the activities you're going to use. Again, you've already done part of that based on our first slide here. Looking at your current resources, doing a strategic analysis of what it is you're actually going to be doing. So again, you're defining your service, uh, de your population of, of, that you're going to be serving. You start putting together your board of trustees. Now, not necessarily with a formal board meeting, but who's going to be on your board? You can talk to people informally. And develop a three-year budget. What's it going to cost you to begin operations? What it's going to cost you to, to actually operate? Now, you're going to say, well, how do I possibly know what we're going to be doing in year three? We haven't even done year one. Well, you start with year one, making a good faith uh, estimate of what you think your costs are going to be and then figure what those costs are likely to be in year two and year three. It's a guide for you because if you don't know how much it's going to cost you to do your program, you're not going to know how much to ask from various sources for funding. So this part is, is really critical. Budgets are a guideline. That's all they are. Uh, these things aren't set in stone, but they are useful for determining what kind of resources you're going to need as you're trying to grow uh, your business. Now, as you're, as you're defining your mission, you want to research the community. And one of the things you want to do right off the bat is figure out who else is doing what you're proposing to do. Maybe, you're, maybe you are unique and no one else is doing it in your geographical area. No one else is doing it. And that's great. And I hope that's the case. But what you're more likely to find is that there's someone else doing, if not the entirety of what you're proposing, at least part of it. And what that means is that these, this group, these other groups, are going to be competing with you for money. And let's just do a hypothetical thing. that You want to do a food bank someplace. Um, you know, you're going to go to foundations and you're going to say, I want to some help funding my food bank, and the foundation's going to be honestly asking the question, wait a minute, we're providing significant funding to the Akron Canton Food Bank, what are you going to do differently? Uh, and maybe there is something that you're going to do that's really different that they aren't doing, uh, but probably more likely no. Um, so are others providing the same or similar services? And maybe you can partner with them, or maybe you can do the piece that they aren't doing. Um, which will save you all sorts of time uh, and money and energy and trying to do a startup nonprofit. Maybe you can join with somebody else. So, so what's your niche going to be? Who are you going to be serving? Um, are you going to be just talking to uh, serving adults or teens or children? Uh, what are their age ranges? Where are their geographical areas? Income status? What are their problems? What are their needs? Um, where are they going to come from? How are you going to contact them? Um, what kind of qualifications will your staff be needing to serve that population? These are all the questions that you need to be asking yourself um, and answering. Then that three-year budget. And um, again, what's it going to cost you to begin, to start? The one-time costs that probably won't reoccur. Do you need to buy some computers or some furniture or just what is it that you need to, uh, to get started? Um, but, and remember that um, nonprofits generally 
aren't able to raise money through loans or through investors. They're typically raised through grants, through donations, fundraisers, potentially crowdfunding, your board of trustees, your board of directors. Um, that's how you're going to get started. Uh, it, but it's very difficult, as we've talked about earlier, to go to a foundation and get startup funding. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. So again, we've already talked about your annual expense needs. Uh, defining your sources of income, once you know what you think it's going to cost you to operate each year, where's the money going to come from? Um, and be precise here. Don't just say foundations, but because you've spent hours and hours at one of the libraries uh, going through the foundation center databases, list specific foundations and the anticipated level of support. And someone had a question, I think you had a question earlier about when do I go to a foundation? Maybe when you get to this point, that's when you start picking up the phone and call, talking to specific foundations and saying, I'm in, doing a business plan and just want to check some things out with you. Maybe that's where you make that call. Can I interject another question? Yes. Well, you know, I don't know why you'd want to do a non-disclosure agreement. Well, maybe not with funders, but, you know, you're like talking with other people. Maybe it's like maybe the foundation is something with other people, individual donors, or like just getting I mean, this, this flies totally in the face of all the transparency arguments that we made somewhat earlier. Well, so Mm -hmm. There's nothing that I'm meeting with people. There's no. There's nothing that would prevent them from sharing that information. Right. With the same person. So at the step where it's building momentum and you're getting ready to launch the business, that's where I'm thinking it makes more sense to set an NDA. Would you agree mm -hmm. or disagree with that? I would mostly disagree because if the information is going to come out eventually. Okay. It's going to have to. So I'm not a big fan of non-disclosure agreements. Um, so again, you have a realistic fundraising plan of how you're going to sustain your, non, your nonprofit, not just the first year, but how you're going to sustain it several years. Um, and will it generate a surplus from operations? What, at least will, it, will the plan generate a surplus of operations? You're never going to know until you actually do it, but will you be able to generate a surplus? Just, it just sits in your, in your accounts. You don't want to put in an endowment because an endowment will restrict how you can draw the money out. Oh, so as assets. Yeah, it just goes on your, in, in, on your balance sheet as assets, yeah. Now when you have that business plan done and you're all, that's when you start filling out the various forms. You start with the Ohio Secretary of State and you, um, do this online, you, then you print the form off and you sign it and send it to Columbus along with a check and they'll turn it around pretty quickly. One of the things that you need to include is with your application is something called your Articles of Incorporation. And these articles uh, determine who you are and what you do. Um, and this is pretty, pretty standard form. And, and when, at the very end here, we're gonna give you some resource material including some downloadable forms that you can just fill out. You also, with the Secretary of State, verify the ability, the availability of a business name uh, to make sure someone else in the state is not using the same name. You register with the Ohio General Attorney to, to I'm sorry, the Ohio Attorney General to, uh, to solicit uh, donations. And then you go to the Internal Revenue Service once you've filed your, with this information with the Ohio Secretary of State and it's been returned to you and you've been incorporated as a nonprofit in the state of Ohio, as a nonprofit in the state of Ohio, then you apply to the Internal Revenue Sur Service using either Form 1023 or 1023 EZ. Now, 1023 is, a, is a, like a 20 page form and most of the places on the form you check yes, no, or does not apply. 
but as part of the 1023, it includes a place for a, a significant narrative uh, statement of your organization's purpose. It also has a place for a three-year budget, um, and it asks you to uh, provide uh, your, either your bylaws or code of regulations, they're an interchangeable term, which determines or defines how your organization is going to be governed. This goes, sir, to your question asked repeatedly today of uh, how, does, how does the board, how, what's the composition of the board? What kind of terms do they serve? Um, how do we remove board members if they aren't functional? Uh, um, what's our mission? What's our purpose? Uh, that's what good bylaws or code of regulations do. And you want to spend significant time writing these. You want them reviewed by an attorney before you submit them. Now, for, using Form 1023 is the way to go if you're going to be a larger nonprofit organization. If you think, though, that you're going to have fairly, um, certainly, good resources, but you're not trying to uh, be a huge organization, you could potentially apply using Form 1023-EZ. And this form is used if you have uh, assets of under $250,000 and, and you project an annual operating budget of $50,000 or below. This, the 1023-EZ is, is apply, you apply for that online, you pay for it online, and the IRS uh, claims to be turning them around rather quickly. I've had now uh, three different clients who've uh, applied using this and they've, they've had their, uh, their uh, application approved within a month to six weeks. So the, if you're planning on a smaller organization, this is definitely the way to go. And the IR, if you use Form 1023, the long form, uh, I've had clients that have uh, re received their approval within about three months. Others, we had one client who spent about a year and a half trying to be approved. The reason for that is that the IRS is a bureaucracy, and I say that in the best sense of the word, but if if there's anything about your application that they question, they put it off to the side. Eventually, someone will get around to going through the papers to the side. Um, so it, it's very helpful if you answer all their questions uh, appropriately and fully the first time around. Now, um, once you have your 501c3 designation from uh, the Internal Revenue Service and you've operated for a year, you have to file an annual tax return. And again, you're not paying taxes, but you are filing this form which details where your revenue came from, what your expenses were, and again, it's, it's pretty broad. Um, and you, depending on the financial, your level of financial activity, you can either, you either use form 990, 990N, or 990EZ. And, it, and again, for many of you, it's probably gonna be the 990EZ form. When this form is filed with the federal government, you also file a copy with the Ohio Attorney General. And that's how you, uh, that's how you fill out your paperwork and become um, a, a 501c3 organization. Now, yes, Beth. Uh, Kimberly. Kimberly, sorry. Yes, Beth. Can you talk about um, fiscal processes? <coughs> sure. I didn't cover that and I should have. Because for some of you, it makes more sense to not go through all this rigmarole, but to find someone who, can, you, who will let you use their uh, tax exempt status, their 501c3 status. And I've had many clients that have done this. Um, they've found someone else that they can partner with or will allow them to use their status. They may charge a little bit of money because of it, it's going to increase that organization's overhead a little bit. But again, rather than you worrying about audits and, and uh, overly complicated financial structures and everything else, if this other organization will keep the books for you and do the audit, um, this makes a whole lot of sense. So it, again, it's finding partnerships that uh, may prove beneficial to you. 
Well, it's again, it's some law, it's further loss of control because now you're having to deal with a whole other organization. Yes, and that's why they may char make a may want to charge you for the some nominal sum for the you know maybe a percent or two of your revenue depending on what the activity level is going to be. Yeah. There's. Well, there's a liability problem though. So you, again, you're going to want to have some really good insurance and you're going to want to have a really good contract or memorandum of understanding between your organization and this fiscal sponsor so that there's no ambiguity. Um, it, uh, but it's a way that some of you may want to think about going. All right, uh, Bob, take us through the next and final steps. Okay. We want to uh, cover some things you can do. SCORE runs a, a whole series of workshops, some of which would be extremely helpful to you. The business planning workshop, for sure, uh, helps you um, understand a business plan and how best to write one. All of these are free. Um, you want to develop your business plan. There are lots of resources for that. Uh, let me skip forward here. These are two of the resources we used in preparing this. Uh, the not-for-profit not kit for dummies and the uh, how to form a not-for-profit corporation booklet from NOLO. Uh, both of these have CD-ROMs in them with sample samples of everything you're going to need. Business plans, bylaws, code of regulation. Uh, everything. Um, so, so these are really, really great resources for you to develop that business plan, which is really what you need to do next before you get moving on to calling the IRS and all of that. Uh, we, you could schedule a personal one-on-one -on -one session with Bill or myself. Um, if you simply call the SCORE office, Pauline, um, we'll... Um, We'll schedule something for you to meet with us, um, and we will, uh, we will facilitate that. There is, in your packet, is there not, Bill, a, uh, that's what I was looking for, a list of other resources. Ah, here it is, here it is, here it is. Right. This is very, very helpful, or can be very helpful to you. Um, the SCORE um, website, of course, will contain all those workshops. The booklets I've talked about. Uh, on business plans, there are a couple of resources. One is SCORE.org. Or, uh, that's the National SCORE organization. Uh, bplans.com has business plans you can use. Fundraising, we talked about Foundation Center, GuideStar. Federal grants uh, are grants.gov. Um, legal assistance. When you get your bylaws done, your code of regulations, you may want somebody to look at those. Uh, SCORE has worked with uh, the University of Akron School of Law. The legal clinic there will give you a, um, an initial session for free, and then there are some sessions beyond that at extremely res reasonable rates. So they're a, they're a really good resource. Um, there are others there. Then the Ohio Secretary of State, IRS, uh, there's information there. Uh, the Akron uh, or the Nonprofit Resources Center uh, at the library. That's where you find the uh, Foundation Center and people who can walk you through that. Um, the Center for Nonprofit Excellence, BVU. Is somebody here from there today? So um, 
they are very good at, at handling things. Um, one of the things we've been asked is, would we do a, a workshop on fundraising? And we've, we've declined to do that because there are workshops on fundraising in the Summit County area all the time by really good people, including BVU. Um, the library used to have one and may periodically have one. Just watch the newspaper, make contacts with people, and you'll find them. There is also a resource that um, we've just become aware of. I've not seen this, but Bill has, and he says it's excellent. It's a book called The Only Grant Writing Book You'll Ever Need uh, by Ellen Karsh, K-A-R-S-H, and Arlene Sue Fox. The only grant writing book you'll ever need. Um, there's one other that I like. On the web, the Digital Media Law Project. Digital Media, Media Law Project. If you go on there and click and click and click. <laughs> uh, okay, here's the clicks. The legal, our legal guide. Then on the map, the state of Ohio. And on the page, the Ohio Legal Guide, you click on forming a nonprofit corporation. And it will walk you through step by step. I mean, all of the government agencies, all of the things you need to do to be in compliance. Let me do that again. The Digital Media Law Project. The legal guide, our legal guide, the map of Ohio, Ohio legal guide, and then forming a nonprofit corporation. It'll take you step by step. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes if anybody wants to uh, ask any questions, stay around. Is there anything before we adjourn? Anybody have any pressing? Yes, ma'am. Sure, it's the only, what do I do with it? I throw it away already? The only grant writing book you'll ever need, I've got it. The only grant writing book you'll ever need, Ellen Karsh, K-A-R-S-H, and Arlene Sue Fox. Is that it? Good, thank you, you've been a wonderful. Oh, there is an evaluation form that I think uh, Pauline just distributed. Uh, we would appreciate it if you would complete that before you leave and leave it in the back for us, please. And thank you again for coming. You're a good group. Thank you. Thank you.